Now, um, before we start our sermon here, once again, I want to invite you to write your name and where you're tuning in from in the comment box uh, session there so that we can have fun and we can know one another and be sure to use that feature to say your amens and to, to make comments so that we can have an interactive and fun time as well. But uh, today we're going to take a break from our series entitled The Precepts of Our Majestic Savior, how I nicknamed the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 all the way through chapter 7. And the reason to do this is that we want to see how people who are born again, members of the kingdom of heaven, should respond to a moment of worldwide crisis. And those of you who are not members of the kingdom of heaven can also benefit from this because we're going to be talking about how to become a member of the kingdom of heaven. And if you're new to Grace Baptist Church, I use that expression, members of the kingdom of heaven or subjects of the kingdom of heaven, to identify people who are born again. And the reason I, I've been doing this is to line up with the book of Matthew, the one we've been studying, that talks about Jesus being our majestic Savior. But like I said earlier, we are charting un uncharted territory. But our great comfort is that we walk with the one who declares the end from the beginning. And also the one whose compassions never fail. And as believers in Christ, our faith is not facing any crisis. Although we experience different emotions during times like these, our confidence that God is unshaken because He still reigns supreme from His throne. Now let me remind you of your position in Christ since we've been talking about this. If you are a born again member of the kingdom of heaven, you are blessed. Remember the Beatitudes from Matthew uh, chapter 5, the beginning of that chapter. You are happy according to divine standards. Not according to the world, but according to divine standards. You have been placed in that position of true bliss, true blessedness, this, uh, regardless of what happens outside. What a great time to be reminded of that therefore our peace surpasses all understanding we are uh, the kingdom of heaven belongs to us we shall be comforted the bible promises the kingdom uh, uh, we will inherit the earth and our appetite for righteousness will be satisfied we shall see god and also we will be called his sons and daughters forever Furthermore, the Bible also uh, says that God granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. That is in 2 Peter uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Therefore, my friend, spiritually speaking, you are fully equipped to deal with the current situation that the world is facing. Just like our brothers and sisters from centuries past uh, dealt with uh, the worldwide crisis of persecution. Now, with that in mind, I want to talk to you today about how subjects of the kingdom of heaven should respond to worldwide crises. Now, um, we know how the people who don't know Christ are dealing with this. They are in panic mode. They are hoarding their resources instead of sharing because they are terrified and they are taking advantage of the vulnerable. We don't need to do any of that. Why? Because again, let me remind you, we are blessed people. Remember the Beatitudes. These are character traits that God has granted to us at the moment of our salvation to live as salt and light in the world. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. So I invite you to turn your Bibles now to 1 Peter in the New Testament so we can see how born-again people are supposed to respond to a moment of worldwide crisis like this. And those of you who are yet to become members of the kingdom of heaven, you are in for a good treat because there are good news that I want to share with you during the time of our um, lesson here. But let me give you the context of the book of 1 Peter. The Apostle Peter writes to first century believers in the region of Asia Minor. His readers face the crisis of persecution by the Roman emperor, a guy by the name of Nero. You may have heard of him. Not a fond dude of Christians. In fact, he rounded them up to be tortured, crucified, and burned alive. In fact, that is the reason why Peter encourages his readers uh, in 1 Peter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Now, 
it would have been natural for some of the readers uh, of this epistle, the original readers, to want to rebel against civil authorities because of the persecution, because of the crisis that they faced. And that's the reason Peter exhorts them to obey the government. He says this in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 14, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether through, uh, to a king as the one in authority or to governors, as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. You see, even in the midst of uh, persecution from the government, Peter tells them we are to submit to the governing authorities because they are ministers of God. And there is a reason behind this. And to encourage the persecuted believers who were reading this letter, Peter describes the Lord in doxology form. And this is how Peter describes him as the initiator of the new birth. As the giver of eternal inheritance, as the protector of our lives and the purifier of our faith. And the source of true joy. Listen to how he describes God in doxology form. Follow along with me. 1 Peter 1 verses 3 through 8. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, he continues, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 8. What a great reminder of the attributes of God, of the sovereignty of God in particular here during the time of worldwide crisis. Also a great time to be reminded of our position as new uh, people, new creatures in Christ, born again believers. And here's how Peter concludes this portion of his letter, the text that we're going to study in detail today. 1 Peter 1, verses 13 through 16. We will keep referring back to that passage. 1 Peter 1, verses 13 through 16. Therefore, he starts, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. That's our text for this morning, church. And here's what we learn. Because of our position in Christ... There is a twofold strategy that we can use in order to endure worldwide crises. A twofold strategy. First of all, in verse 13, we endure a worldwide crisis by exercising hope. Exercising hope. Verse 13. Every time a paragraph in the Bible starts with the word, therefore, obviously we need to read what comes before to see what, what comes next is therefore. And we just read Peter's elaborated doxology to God here, who promises salvation and grace, suffering and glory, and provides a sanctification and godliness. And the apostle therefore concludes with two commands, um, the first of which he articulates in the second half of verse 13. But you may ask, Pastor, I think I see three commands in here. Didn't you just read, prepare your minds, keep sober and fix uh, your hope completely on the grace that is coming to you. I am glad you noticed that because the main verb of that sentence is uh, the, the one in the second half of verse 13. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you. The other two in the original are participles that carry the force or reinforce the main command. And that main command is to fix your hope on the grace to be brought to you. Uh, at the revelation of Christ. Now, forgive me, I do not mean to give you a lecture on Greek grammar, but only my uh, purpose for doing this is to point out to you that, w first of all, as believers in Christ, when faced with a worldwide crisis, we are to fix our hope on God's grace, first, by preparing our minds for action. First, by preparing our minds for action. In other words, to train our brains, 
Now, in fact, to borrow Paul's argument around the same principle, uh, and which parallels this idea, we can say it like him in Romans 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is that is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, we let the Word of God transform our minds in a time like this because um, people who don't know Jesus Christ have no hope. They, they are hoping in their finances, which uh, is going to uh, suffer in the next few weeks, in the next uh, few months. Now, if we go again to the original uh, expression in 1 Peter verse uh, 13 of chapter 1, the author uses a metaphor that involves clothing, I want you to know, or it involves a, a wardrobe. So the sentence would read something like this, the original. And some of your Bible translations may have this. Having girded up the loins of your mind, having girded up the loins of your mind, fix your hope on the grace to be brought to you. And the readers of Peter immediately knew and understood what he meant. The idea is to be properly dressed for action, to put on the right apparel, like an athlete who is ready to compete or run a marathon would not wear a suit and tie. But a tight pants would be more appropriate to facilitate movement and action. That's the idea. Now, therefore, what we understand is this, church, when faced with a major crisis, our first step is to dress our minds appropriately for action, not for, uh, to be idle, but for action, and to appropriately exercise the hope that we already have. See, remember the text we just read, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope, the hope that brings life. We already have that hope. We just need to dress up our minds and prepare our minds for action. In other words, this is time for us to act. And the way we do this is we exercise our hope. In, in this particular case, we aim that hope on the grace to be brought to us at the revelation of Christ. Now, our current situation, the pandemic of 2020, who will make it to the history books, classifies as a worldwide crisis. And we know that because when people interrupt travel and, and, and major sporting events, uh, we know that the situation is alarming. Now, the situation may be alarming, but we do not panic. We pay attention to reliable sources of information. That's how we exercise hope. We, we, we are active. We pay attention to the reliable sources of information, but we clothe our minds with the Word of God. That's how the believer prepares for action. Consider this, my friend. The period of recommended social distance is a perfect opportunity for you to dust off your Bible and read it. Take the Word of God. Take a healthy dose, an intake dose of the Word of God. That's how you will prepare your mind for action. Let me give you a suggestion. If you're not sure how to start, start with the book of Revelation. How about that? And the reason I say this is because the book of Revelation, which many people say is one of the hardest in the Bible, actually starts with a blessing saying, Blessed are those who read the prophecy of this book. Of this book. So the book promises to bless you, my friend. Do you want to be blessed? Then open up the word of God and consume it like food, like water for a thirsty soul. But let me uh, point out to the uh, second command in verse uh, 13 here, the second uh, participle, actually, that functions as a command here. The sentence, keep sober. Now, why is Peter using that expression, keep sober? And uh, the reason for that, friends, is that sobriety, uh, uh, the, the idea of sobriety here, uh, is that fear can cause people to act as if they are intoxicated as if they are out of control. Um, so he, uh, the original would have, read, would have read something like this, having girded up the loins of your mind and being sober-minded, fix your hope on the grace to be brought to you. And again, the reason he says that is per, uh, precisely to avoid the frenzy of panic, to avoid people for, uh, from uh, thinking that this is something new. He says, do not be surprised because um, God's got this under control. In fact, this is for the purifying of your faith, he says. And therefore, church, we embrace this principle. We keep sober in spirit. Why? We do not panic. We do not act out of control because we are controlled by the Holy Spirit. In fact, Paul mirrors that idea when he writes to the Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, which means to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. 
Now, in these last weeks, we have seen how lack of sobriety of mind and spirit, fueled by anxiety and fear and self-centeredness, caused people to act irrationally. It, it, it dictated their purchasing uh, behavior. And people have been coming to blows and grocery stores and hoarding food that will spoil unless they share it. Now, that's the opposite of sobriety of mind. The opposite of what the Bible recommends uh, for, in fact, commands for us to do here. Now, we, those of us who have been born again to a living hope, we don't need to do any of that. We are active. We keep sober in spirit. We keep the sobriety of mind, but we prepare our minds for action. We rechannel our hope completely, not partially. Remember, completely rechannel your faith, your, your hope on the, on the grace to come. And this is a great time to readjust your priorities, my friend. If your hope is in anything other than God, yes, you do have reason to panic. But unless your hope is in the Word of God, is in the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, you have reason to rejoice because this will pass. That's good news. Can you handle some good news? This crisis will pass. In fact, uh, my uh, former senior pastor used to say that one of his favorite sentences in the Bible is, it came to pass. And uh, I, I agree. This is a great time to remind that this situation will pass. It will go away. It's just a matter of how we deal with it now. Now, in verse 13, remember, once again, refers to a time when viruses will be no more, when diseases will be no more, fear will be eradicated, anxiety gone, greed will be history, selfishness will be a thing of the past, and ultimately, death will be put to death. Why? Because that is going to happen at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if you are a believer in Christ, my friend, the moment you die, your body stops functioning, your soul and spirit are ushered immediately into the presence of God. And therefore, we share Paul's perspective on this whole thing. In Philippians 1, verse 21, and remember, this was written by a man who was in prison for preaching the gospel. And he says this, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he continues, but I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is far much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. But you say, Pastor, so what are you saying? Are you saying we're supposed to desire death? Of course not, friend. We have goals to accomplish. We have people to care for. And in my case, I have a flock to shepherd. I don't look forward to death, but I have this spiritually invigorating dilemma that Paul had. And you have it too. We live for Christ now. But uh, we, uh, to be in his physical and eternal company is infinitely better. So we have both, the best of both worlds here. This is a healthy paradox. And it puts our current worldwide crisis in the right context here, in the right perspective. Uh, we do what we have to do here and now in the present, but we live in light of our bright future. We exercise that hope, the hope that uh, we will see Jesus Christ and we will live forever in Him because of what He has done for us to pay for the penalty of our sin and give us eternal life. So, because of our new position... The first step on our twofold strategy on how to endure a worldwide crisis is we exercise hope. But the second part is in verses 14 through 16. We exercise, not only we exercise hope, but we exemplify holiness. So we endure worldwide crisis by exemplifying holiness. Verses 14 through 16. Now, listen to how Peter starts verse 14 again. He restates a wonderful truth. That we are sons and daughters of God because we have been born again. Now, the Bible confirms that before uh, um, Peter uh, even says that John writes that in his gospel. In the beginning, uh, John 1 verse 12, the gospel of John chapter 1 verse 12, he says, As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, before I came to Christ, I used to be under the impression that everyone was a child, was, uh, uh, ch were children of God. The Bible says, no, that only people who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, but, and not of the will of flesh, but the will of God are considered children of God. Therefore, my friend, if you are a believer in Christ, you are a son or daughter of God. And Peter reminds us of that immediately. 
Now, before Jesus came into our lives, we were sons of disobedience, the Bible says. And Paul reminds us of that in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. He says this, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulges in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath as the rest. See, that's the bad news. That's the before of the before and after picture. And because now comes one of my favorite expressions of the Bible here in Ephesians 2. But God. See, one of my favorite expressions of the Bible is, but God. Why? Because the Bible assures us that, oh yeah, there was a crisis in 2020, but God. See, I was a son of disobedience, but God. See, I was in anxiety and in fear, but God. See, my financial situation is out of control, but God. I am sick, but God. And now he continues in Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show us the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You see, church, our new position is that we are seated with him in the heavenly places, which means our our place is secure. No matter what happens down here, my friend, if you're a a born-again a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have a but God in your life, that means that your place is guaranteed in heaven because of what the Bible says. He seated you with a Christ in the heavenly places. Why? To show us the surpassing riches in grace, in kindness of his grace, in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Did you get that? We no longer walk according to the course of this world, church, because of the kindness of God. We don't walk according to the course of this world. That doesn't mean we're aliens. It means we gladly obey the word of God because we love the God of the word. Because he first loved us. And because he loved us, he placed us in Christ. And we are now, therefore, free from his wrath. We are no longer children of wrath, but we are now sons and daughters by adoption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, church and friends, We do not face a worldwide crisis the way the sons of disobedience or children of wrath do. Because these conditions don't define us anymore. Instead, as scripture reminds us, we are to exemplify holiness. Why? Because we have been set apart for God. He declared us saints and holy. And how do we do that? We let the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Did you, get, did you catch that? You have the peace of God which transcends all understanding. Don't try to explain it because the Bible says it surpasses all understanding. We stay alert. We follow the guidelines from our government, but we beseech God in prayer. And we rejoice in the Lord always. And we celebrate together, even though we can't be together physically. But in one heart, we celebrate the truth that Christ upholds all things by the word of his power in Hebrews 1, 3. That's what the Bible says. Christ upholds all things by the word of his power, my friend. What part of that do you not understand? That includes your life. He upholds your life by the word of his power. He upholds your financial situation. He upholds your health in in his infinite wisdom and sovereignty. He allows you to go through the coronavirus for his honor and for his glory. We do it gladly with rejoicing in our hearts because he upholds all things by the word of his power. Although we pray and we thank God that no one so far in our congregation here has been infected and we pray for everybody's health. But I want you to know that the main verb in this sentence in 1 Peter 1 verses 14 through 16 is in verse 15, the command to be holy in behavior. And notice the modifier here, be holy in behavior. And the idea of non-conforming to the lusts of our pre-conversion days strengthens the imperative here, the command. But further emphasizing this command is the example of the Holy One who called us. Did you notice that? Follow the example of the Holy One who called us. Who is that, church? 
that is Jesus Christ, the perfect man, the God man, the son of God, who is God, the son, divine holiness and divine kindness in flesh and blood. And again, this is not new. Peter is restating a biblical truth that Paul had already pointed out to the Corinthians. Be my imitators as I am an imitator of Christ. So in other words, church, how do we exemplify holiness? We look at Jesus Christ. We fix our eyes on him. We read about him. We learn about him. And we try to imitate him in everything we do. And remember, he knows what crisis is. He endured the mother of all crises by going to the cross for you, for me, to pay the penalty for my sin and for your sin. And that is the reason why we can exemplify holiness, because we are holy In the sight of God. And every time the Bible speaks about holiness, referring to people, referring to our holiness, it's the same idea of the term saint. Which means to be set apart for God, to be set apart from God and to God and by God. And Peter specifies that the behavior aspect of the believer's holiness means that in a moment of global crisis, specifically, our conduct must match the highest standard of excellence, the highest standard of holiness, fitting for representatives of a God who was holy, holy, holy. Now, what does that mean for us to exemplify holiness? Let's talk specifics now. Here's what that holy behavior looks like in practice. And I'm going to give you four examples straight from the Word of God, specifically now for our context. This is how we apply the truth of the Word of God. First of all, we do not despair. That's number one. How do we exemplify holiness? We do not despair. Now, how else will the world see that there is hope in Jesus unless those of us who are sons and daughters of God demonstrate this truth? Now, here's what Paul told the Galatians. And again... We're restating biblical truth here. He says in Galatians 6 verse 9, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So church, family, friends, this is not the time to grow weary. It's time to cling to our great physician and our provider. This is a perfect time for the world to see, according to Psalms 20 verse 7, that some trust in chariots and others in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Now number two, in terms of application of holiness here, we lift each other up with words. We lift each other up with words. This is not the time, my friend, to criticize. Or those of you who have the gift of criticism, hold off on that for now. This is not the time. Because Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11, Encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Now, families, what that means is this is not the time to fight. This is not the time to argue or to hold grudges. Uh, Go to other rooms of the house if you have to, but this is not the time to do this. Husbands, let me address you for a moment. Tell your wife how much you love her, my friend. She is the cook, the chauffeur, the nurse, the entertainer, the therapist, the chief operations officer of your house. And now she just became the principal of a homeschooling operation. She is the hero of your house. Make sure you remind her of that tenderly. And wives, tell your husbands how much you appreciate his leadership. He was probably awake last night trying to figure out how to uh, provide for you and your children. Now is the time to shower him with affirmation because the Bible tells us it's time to do that. We're supposed to do this anyway, but what a great time to be reminded in a moment of worldwide crisis. Number three of our applications here of holiness, we do not rise up in rebellion against our government leaders. This is not the time for this. Do not take civil disobedience out of context. There is a time uh, for respectful civil disobedience. According to the book of Acts, this is not one of them. The only reason we would do that is if our government orders us to shut our doors because we're preaching the truth. If that ever happens, then we pacifically, respectfully stand our ground and we continue to do what God has called us to do, even if it costs us our freedom, even if it costs us our lives. This is not the case for this. Now, this current pandemic um, is the time for our president and for our state governors to receive our prayers and cooperation. Uh, They are under enormous stress. 
How do we know that we're supposed to pray for them? They're not our enemies. They are uh, ministers of God to us in such a time as this. The Bible says that. Let me remind you, Romans 13, verses 1 and 2, Paul says this to the Romans. And remember, these are people who are under persecution and who could um, lose their lives at any moment. He says this, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon, upon themselves. So now, church, we gladly comply with the recommendation of our government because we understand that God is really the one who put him in there uh, for such a time as this. And also we want to love our neighbors. We want to love and protect our people. And if we're told that this is a highly contagious virus and we're recommended to stay six feet apart, let's do that. If they recommend that we're not supposed to meet together, thank God for the technology that allows us to do that. And let me tell you, this is temporary. Remember, there will be a, a, in, a very, uh, in, in the future, very soon, we will be able to meet here again and, and do our handshaking and, and do our, our fellowship that we normally do. This is a temporary temporary disruption of our activities and uh, we are curious to see what God wants to accomplish through this but one thing that I've been praying for and I hope you join me in this that we will never ever look at church attendance the same way we do after this I hope you are praying with me for this number four as stewards of the resources that God has entrusted to us we share. We do not hoard. This is not the time to follow the bad example of the people of Israel leaving Egypt, hoarding the manna that God had to let spoil because of their disobedience. This is not the time to do that. And we have a lot to learn from the early church. Luke tells us in Acts 4 verse 32 that the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. Acts 4 verse 32. And in case you're thinking I'm defending communism, let me clarify something here. I am not saying that the book of Acts teaches communism for a very simple reason. This is not government mandated. They were voluntarily giving up their um, uh, resources for the good of others. And why? Because they recognized that they were stewards of those resources, managers, not owners, that God owns everything. And for that reason, they rejoiced in sharing everything because they were of one heart and one soul. And they also understood our according to Acts, two, uh, Acts 20, verse 35, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. You will have many opportunities to do this during this time, and I hope you take advantage of the opportunity to share what you have. Now, in the last verse of this paragraph, Peter appeals to Scripture as the motivator for our holy behavior. According to the apostle here, um, Believers are to be holy like Jesus is holy because of what is written. And he quotes then from Leviticus 11 verse 44 through 45. Again, he goes back to scripture. He goes back to the word of God. And in that portion of scripture, Leviticus 11 verse 44 through 45, God is reminding the people of Israel that he delivered them from bondage in Egypt. And my friend, here's the parallel. If you are a born again believer... In Christ, God has delivered you from the bondage of sin. Remember, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God, remember that but God portion of that is your deliverance. You have been freed, my friend, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, from the condemnation of sin. You have been freed from the control of sin in your life, and you will be free uh, uh, in the future from the very consequence of sin, which is eternal separation from God. And that's what Peter is talking about here. We're fixing our hope on the glory, to, on the grace to be received at the revelation of Jesus Christ, talking about the future aspect of our salvation. But now, my friend, in the present, you have been freed from the control of sin, and therefore your sin does not define your life anymore. And in a moment of crisis, we do not go into a frenzy, anxiety, and fear, but we go to the Lord. Why? Because we have been freed by Him. We have been delivered from those things. Now, again, before we had been freed from the uh, control of sin, and we didn't know how to act, but now that we know and we learn to cast our care on the Lord. Peter reminds us 
In 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 7, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Let me repeat this in case you missed the church. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Again, what part of that do we not understand? The Bible could not have been clearer at this point. He cares for you. He's got you covered. He's got you well looked after. We just need to cast our anxiety upon him. And my friend, I want, you, I want to invite you today to do that collectively as an act of obedience to God. Um, are you worried about the coming economic uh, consequences of this crisis? Is this isolation uh, causing you to lose sleep? Let's place our anxiety at the foot of the cross where our great God and Savior purchased us with his own blood. To make us zealous for good deeds, according to Titus 2, verse 14. And once again, in case you missed that principle from the New Testament, the Old Testament states the same idea in Psalms 55, verse 22. Let me read it for you. Cast your burden upon the Lord. Cast your burden upon the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Again, friend, this is a clear a clear word from the Word of God. We are to cast our burden on Him and He will sustain us. You want to hear more good news, friend? The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God, uh, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold in Psalms 18 verse 2. Now is the perfect time, my friend, to quote scripture back to God. In fact, I recommend you do that. And let's do this together in your homes. We're, we're going to recite Psalms verse 23 here. Just follow along with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. You see, that is fixing our hope on the glory and the grace to be revealed to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And church, Grace Baptist, friends of our ministry, listeners, viewers, this is how we endure a worldwide crisis, by exercising the hope that we have been given when we became born again by the grace of God. And we also exemplify holiness by following the example of our great God and Savior, the one who called us into a state of holiness, being separated uh, by God and to God. But let me conclude with some more good news, okay? Can you handle some more good news in the time of reading bad news? This pandemic will pass, like I said. Some people will be more affected than others. That's a fact. But eventually, our lives will slowly get back to the routine. Unfortunately, the tendency of the human heart is to place our relationship with God back in the bottom of the priority list, if that's the case for you. And I hope that it is, this is not going to be the case for any of us. I hope that God is shaking us up so that we can put him right where he belongs in the place of priority in our hearts. And I hope that we never look at church attendance in the same way. I hope that we will never prioritize anything else other than coming together on Sunday morning to worship and to bring our hearts and unite our hearts in worship to our great God and Savior. And my prayer is that God will use this temporary disruption of our day-to-day -day lives to remind us of his love, of his power, of his um, sovereignty, and of his compassion and his kindness. And speaking of the kindness of God, in case any of you listening this morning were not aware, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And my friend, Jesus Christ came to this world to endure the biggest crisis that ever entered the universe or the human experience. He received the wrath of God so that we can be called children of God. We just read that. And because of your sin and mine, he took the punishment that we deserved. And he went to the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. But he rose again. And to 
Today he offers eternal life and everlasting life to anyone who turns to him. How do I know that? Because he said it in the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28. He says, come to me. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My friend, do you want the rest that comes from God? Then come to Christ. I invite you, come to Jesus Christ today if you are weary and heavy laden with worry. If you are carrying the burden on your shoulders of anxiety and fear, I invite you to come to Jesus Christ and place those things at the foot of the cross because the Bible says He will give you a new life. You will be made new. You will be born again when you turn to Him and repent from your sin and in faith turn to Him to save you. I urge you to respond. Turn from your sin. Embrace Christ today. He will make you a new person. You will be born again to a living hope. Not a hope on the things of this earth who are easily depleted. Not a hope on finances. Not a hope on money who can easily go away. But a living hope. A hope that brings life because of our inheritance that is reserved in heaven for us, the Bible says. And you will be born again to that living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Let me know you made that decision today. Type it in the comment box. I will contact you or somebody here from our staff. We want, to, we want you to know we're praying for you. We love you. We care about you. We want to do everything we can to serve you. Now is the time for us to unite together and ask together in prayer what God has in mind through all of this. Even if we don't know, in faith, we come together. Even if, it not, if not physically, but we come together in worship to Him. But the first step guest or friend or even if you've been coming to grace baptist church if you have not yet turned to jesus christ in repentance and faith today is the day to do that because the bible says today is the day of salvation if you hear his voice do not harden your heart my encouragement to you is to do that and let us know somehow we'll get in touch with you i'm going to invite the uh, uh, pammy and alec and the and, and mark here to come and sing a song for us as we close after they sing a song I will come and close us in prayer. God Let's bless pray. you. Father, thank you again for the opportunity we have to come together, if not physically, Lord, through technology. It's not ideal. It's second best, Lord. But we know that you, we unite our hearts. And we thank you for the technology to do this, Lord. I can't imagine if this happened 15 years ago, Lord. And uh, we thank you, therefore, Lord, for uh, the opportunity to still check in with one another and to see... Uh, faces, Lord, in some of these uh, platforms, Lord. And again, during this time, Lord, we, we are resting in you, Lord. We are hoping in you and we are waiting upon you to see, Lord, what you want to accomplish through this, Lord. We know that this is a perfect time to tell others about Christ, a perfect time to uh, read our Bibles, to meditate on your word, and to run to you, run to your loving arms, Lord. And Father, um, if anybody who listened to this message today, Lord, is not yet a follower of Christ, Lord, I pray that you will transform that heart or those hearts, Lord, so that they will be the new birth, Lord, and people will experience uh, that peace that surpasses all understanding, Lord. Although uh, the situation is severe, Lord, we are trusting in you, Lord. We don't panic. Father, you got this thing under control, and we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for our church. Our, our building here. We understand the church is not the building, but the people. And we, we praise you for that, Lord. But we thank you for the ability to meet together here, Lord, as your people. And we're looking forward to that homecoming uh, that we will have here, perhaps in a few months, Lord, who knows. But in the meantime, we'll use this time to draw near to you. We thank you. We love you. We want to do everything for your honor, for your glory in Jesus' name. God bless, friends.